If you will, turn with me in your Bibles to the Gospel of Mark. I'm going to be reading from verse 24 through 30. As we have been looking at some of the Gospel pictures in Mark, about the Lord Jesus Christ as he interacts with people, teaching them, healing them. And today he gives us an example of what faith is like. And you notice in some of your Bible versions, this section is entitled, The Syrophoenician Woman's Faith. A great example. Let's see what Mark is going to tell us about this Gentile woman whose faith exceeds that of many of the Jews of the day. And from there he arose and went away to the region of Tyre and Sidon. And he entered a house and did not want anyone to know, yet he could not be hidden. But immediately a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit heard of him, came and fell down at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile, a Syrophoenician by birth, and she begged him to cast the demon out of her daughter. He said to her, Let the children be fed first, for it is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. But she answered, Yes, Lord, yet even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. And he said to her, For this statement, you may go your way. The demon has left your daughter. And she went home and found the child lying in bed and the demon gone. Let's pray and ask God to bless his word. Our Heavenly Father, we have read of great faith. Now we ask that through your Holy Spirit that you will instill in us a desire for that same type of faith and relationship with you. Be with us now. Have mercy upon us. Amen. Once there was a kindly uncle who was living in Florida, and he was going to go to a northern city to see one of his nephews. Now, the kindly uncle did not want to go to this northern city to see his nephew empty-handed. So he thought, well, what should I get this child? Get him a Game Boy. You know, get him one of those video games that the kids like. So he went to Best Buy and purchased one. Now, he did not purchase the best one because it was so expensive. He didn't have money to buy that. But he got a good one. So he packs his bag, gift traps the package, puts it in his suitcase, gets on an airplane, and flies to Chicago. And when he gets off the plane, the family is there, the little nephew is there, and he bends over and says to the child, I've got a surprise for you. The little child says, well, what is it, what is it, what is it? And he opens his suitcase and gives him a package of the there's a card, but the little child doesn't pay any attention to that. He just tosses it aside. The papers fly everywhere, and he opens it up. Now, you would have thought that little child would have had a smile on his face, but no. It's a friend. And he says to the uncle, This isn't what I wanted. I wanted the best of the line. You got me this always. So cheap. Hmm. What would you think of that child? Well, he's awfully presumptuous. He is also a child who has no social manners, as we say down south. No social graces. And yet, he is also full of pride because you know what else he said? I deserve the best. The child saying, I deserve the best. When I think of that story, and I think about the Bible passage that we read this morning, 
It makes me wonder at times, do we approach God the same way? Do we approach Jesus with this attitude, I deserve it. I deserve that. I deserve it. I'm worth it. Now, when we think of the Christian faith, there is no doubt the work of God is this, to believe in the one that he has sent, and you may save yourself, and faith should be accompanied by love. But it should also be coupled with humility. Humility in approaching Christ. And when you look at this passage here, let's think about the demand that the text makes of us. The story starts out with Jesus, and he is trying to get away once again from the crowds. And let's be honest, if you are in the people business, those crowds can be demanding. People always want something from you. That is why it is good if you're in the people business to get away from it all for a while. And that's what Jesus wants. After all, these people either they want to make him a king, they want a miracle, they want someone to teach them and to cure their spiritual maladies. But Jesus is fully God and fully human, and he needs a break. So he tries to get away. Here's what he does. Instead of saying in the Jewish section here, he decides that he wants to go to the north, to Tyre, to a place that is in Gentile territory, not where the Jews are. So he goes off to that place, thinking that he can get away and get a break from all these people. So it says that he goes there, and he tries to go into a house because he did not want anyone to know, yet he could not be hidden because there is a woman there. This is where the tension starts in. This woman has a problem. And she falls at Jesus' feet with a sign of humility and starts begging him repeatedly over and over again. My daughter has an unclean spirit. Can you do something? Do something, Jesus. Can you do something? Jesus can't get away. And I don't know what you would think if you were in that position. Maybe you'd say, uh, sorry, business hours are not open yet. Sorry, got to come back during office hours. Jesus doesn't do that. And here's what he does do. And this is where the tension is, is building here. Listen to what he says. He says to this Gentile Syrophoenician woman, let the children be fed first. For it is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. Hmm. Strange, isn't it? Is that what you would expect from Jesus? Let me tell you what Jesus is doing here. First of all, Jesus' ministry at the start, was to the Jews. He was to save his people from their sins. And so far up to this point, that is where the major part of his ministry has been spent. And the Jews were considered to be the family of God. They had the covenant promises. These are the people who had the law of God. And those Gentiles, they were the outsiders. Now, at this point, you shouldn't think uh, too harshly of Jesus for calling this lady a dog. Actually, the word is a little more specific. It's little dogs. It's family pets. And get the image here. Even back then, they had family pets. And if it's like the dogs I have, they're vacuum cleaners. If there's a crumb on the floor, anything, they'll eat it up. And Jesus said, look, my ministry is to feed my people first. It's to take care of your, their needs, not your needs. But listen to this woman's response. She said, yes, Lord, but even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Do you know what this woman wants? Just crumbs. 
She doesn't want the best. She just wants crumbs of grace, crumbs of mercy, crumbs of the kingdom. She is willing to say, you're right, Lord, I don't deserve the best. I just deserve the crumbs. And when you think of the demand that this text makes of us, this woman is held up as an example of great faith. So much so that Jesus says, go your way. The demon has left your child, and that's exactly what happened. But what is it that makes her faith so special? It is the humility which a Gentile, not a Jew, approaches Jesus. What is the God of truth and faith? It is one that comes to Jesus not with pride, but with a grain of humility. Perhaps you've heard of the actor Dwayne Johnson. One of his lines is this, a man's got to know his place. Well, let me tell you here, this woman knows her place. She knows she's an outsider. She knows she's not part of the country. That went to God's people in the Old Testament, but yet she demonstrates greater faith than many of those who were in the covenant. She professes a great faith. I want you to think of other stories in the Bible which should give us more insight to what this passage is about. Think of the story in which two people come to the synagogue to pray. One, Pharisee, God, I'm glad I'm not like that sinner over there. And then the tax collector, God have mercy on me, a sinner. Who knows their place in the kingdom of God? Is the Pharisee who seems to come and seems to say, you owe me, God? Or is it the tax collector who's basically saying, I'll take those crumbs of mercy, God. I'll take those crumbs of grace. Here's a test case to see if you fall into that category. Have you ever felt God owes you more? You know when that's going to happen? When something doesn't go your way. And you're going to be thinking to yourself, but I'm so spiritual. Oh, I pray so much. I get to the church. I come to the church every day. I have to tell them. Why I even come to the Wednesday night suppers. God, you love me. Why isn't this happening? God, what are you doing? You're disappointed with God. You're disappointed with Jesus. And you say to yourself, well, I don't deserve what's my doctrine. Whatever happened to wanting those crumbs of grace, those crumbs of mercy, Crumbs can be pretty good. Very good crumbs. Especially if they come from the Lord's table. Now, I think we get the point here, don't we? You approach God humbly, not desiring the best all the time. But let's be honest. You and I are going to have a hard time with this. And let me tell you why you're going to have. First of all, it's a society and the culture we live in. There was a news story. It is about a children's group that is working with students in a Scandi County in the public school. And here's what was going on in the news story on Channel 3. These kids were carrying signs. I'm special. I'm great. And also there was another one that said, get the police out of the school, which kids, they don't get why the police is there. But he made those signs. I'm special. I'm great. I deserve more. Now, in a certain sense, yes, everyone is special in the eyes of God. But that's not what this is saying. And there's something in our culture where we want to elevate ourselves and to think that we're all special. Never mind there's like 7 billion people in the world today. Never mind uh, that there are other people who may be more gifted and talented than you are. Never mind any of that, you're special. There's a sense where I don't have a problem with telling someone they're special, but there's also a sense that I do have a problem with that. The problem is other people. <clears throat> there's a lot of people. 
And they're also gifted and special too. But all of a sudden, we focus in on ourselves and we start to think in our society, I deserve it my way. You owe me. And it really comes down to a basic sense of pride. And we are often told that if we have not achieved anything in life, it's not your fault that you're a sinner. It's society's fault, it's culture's fault, and it's somebody else's fault, but it's not your fault. <laughs> That's why it's going to be hard for us to obey what God has said. Here's another reason why it's going to be hard. We're sinners. There is something deep inside of us in which we want to be known. We want to prove without God that we are of value. That we are important. That you are important in the sight of God, but only because of Jesus Christ. But when we take God out of the picture and we start thinking of it in, purely, in terms of purely human terms, there's a problem there. Because we are all children of dust. Made from the ground. But that is the human disposition, the human sinfulness of it all. We all want to be, as they say today, the goat. The greatest of all time. This is going to make us feel good. And you may say, that's not me. No, I have a feeling deep down inside of us whenever we approach God. We want God to say, you know, you really are great on your own. That's it. That's it. So as we look at what God wants, and we look at the problems, the only way that we're ever going to get any help in this matter is to look at what Jesus is really like. Now, this may be a little bit hard for us to wrap our heads around, but you realize Jesus was a very humble person. We don't often think of the humility of Christ, but his life on this earth was quite humble, humble circumstances. And listen to what it says in Philippians chapter 2. It warns us to do all things without grumbling, to be innocent children in a twisted generation. It says, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourself. Let each of you look not to your own interest, but also to the interest of others. And here is the key. Have this mind among you, which is yours in Jesus Christ who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And when I think of the life of Jesus Christ, and I think of him becoming a servant, I think of his temptations. And here he is, the Son of God, who controls the world. And what does he do? He goes into the desert for 40 days and 40 nights, doesn't eat, doesn't drink, has to face Satan. Satan tempts him. Did Jesus have to do this? No. But he did, for your sake. And he says that I must do what my Father wants me to do. I think of the story in the Mount of Olives where Jesus. He's facing death. And the fear of facing the wrath of God. And at first he says what we would all say, Father, take this from me. Then he says, not my will, but your will. Because Jesus knows that he's a servant. And when we approach God, we approach in the footsteps of Jesus, who is a servant of God, a suffering servant. And look at this passage. Look at this passage. You could have said, get away from me, woman. No, sorry. Not standard procedure. No, can't help you. But even though he's tired, he still sees himself as a servant, willing to heal. So you want to know how, even though there are barriers that are going to stand in our way, how would we follow the footsteps of Jesus? It's we keep our sights on Jesus Christ. Because he was the humble servant. He died for prideful people like 
us. What should motivate your hearts is that Christ went this way. This is our example, along with this woman. This should inflame our hearts because he did this for you. And not only that, I want you to think of those crumbs of the king. See, they're really just the others. Because the Bible tells us of another banquet, the wedding feast of the Lamb. And the crumbs of grace and mercy that we receive, they're going to only be the foretaste of the great banquet in which we dine with Jesus Christ in the new heavens and the new earth. And I'll take those crumbs of grace and mercy now because of what they're going to point to and lead to when I, you are with Jesus Christ forever and you are no longer merely servants, but you are sons and daughters of a living God. And you bank with, with him with all the saints that have come before us. And when she looks at you and says, Ah, my son and daughter here, Let's eat and drink from the best. Now, sometimes the crumbs will do just fine this world. And I guess the real question this morning is, are we willing to accept those crumbs? And are we willing to do it because we can look at Jesus Christ? Christ, the one who fulfilled the law in a way that we never could. Christ, who could truly be humble in a way that we never could. Christ, who gives us the crumbs, which are nothing more than the first servings of the great banquet that is to come. I'll take those crumbs of mercy and grace. Let's pray. Our Lord and our God, help us to remember that yes, we are to be humble as we approach you. But also let us think of the humility of our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for our sins. And may it show us a way in which we can live in this world without always expecting to get the main course now. Help us to be thankful for the crumbs of grace that we receive and to come to you humble sinners in need of mercy. I make this prayer in your name. Amen. Our final